Yes. Good morning. How's everyone? Good, good, good. It's so good to uh, to be here this morning. It's always good to to be able to share and uh, and get into God's word. If you've got your Bibles with you, go ahead and flip over to the book of Philippians. Philippians is in the New Testament. It's with all the other uns, Corinthians, Ephesians, it's Philippians. Um, Pastor Larry, the last few weeks, has been speaking about vision. And vision is one of my favorite things um, to talk about. Vision is the thing that's going to propel us into our destinies. Without vision, as we, as we learned in the first week, we perish or, or, or we never reach where we're going. Paul, I believe, was a man who had great vision. So Paul wrote the book of Philippians. Paul wrote this to the church at Philippi. Paul planted that church at Philippi in his second missionary trip in about 50 AD when, uh, when he made that journey. And then Paul wrote back to this church this letter while he was in captivity. He was in prison. Um, scholars are still a little bit... Um, undetermined on exactly which time he was in prison when he wrote this, but he was in prison when he wrote this back to them. And if you read through the book of Philippians, one of my favorite uh, books in the Bible, it's got an incredible theme of joy. And while Paul was in captivity, while Paul was being held against his will, he still spoke about joy and rejoice all through this book. So I, I love this book, but it's got some of the verses that, that we quote so often um, in, in our Christian circles as well, written in this book. So if, you, if you're over in the book of Philippians now, let's start reading from chapter 2, verse 3. The Bible says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. If you've got something you can underline, underline selfish. Selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only at your own interests, but also at the interest of others. Your, atti- your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, And being found in the appearance of the man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of God our Father. I want to talk to you this morning about ambition. I believe ambition is one of the things that drive any vision that anybody has ever had for their life. But I believe there is a holy ambition. See, see, ambition in itself is not a bad term that the Bible's speaking about. It's when you put that word selfish in front of it then ambition becomes something that that is not going to edify God. But when we look for a holy ambition, then we're looking for something that's going to edify and glorify God's purpose in your life. An ambition is really just a desire of an achievement or of an end goal. If you have an ambition for something in your life, It is what's going to drive that vision into your life. I don't believe there's ever been a vision, I don't believe there's ever been a visionary who didn't, who was not ambitious. We we, we think about Paul who wrote this book. Paul had to be an ambitious man. He wrote wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He went and planted churches, even, even to his own demise. He was ambitious in what he did, but he had a holy ambition. He had an ambition that came from God, something that God had put on him, not something that was selfish for himself. So we should be doing nothing out of selfish ambition, but an ambition for God. Let let me me share personally so we can kind of grab this. 
I grew up in a home. I was, I was the first one in my family to go to university. My family was, was not very wealthy. We were not very educated. I was the first one to be able to go to university. It was an ambition and a vision of mine to do that. I've got a degree in um, engineering. I finished university. I got my first job. And I had an ambition. It was a selfish ambition, but I had an ambition. My ambition was to retire at 30. I wanted to have a lot of money. I wanted to have the nice cars. I wanted to have the big home. I wanted to be done. It was a selfish ambition. God began to work in my life when I became an engineer to work with people who were less privileged. A lot of what I came from in my background, God began to put a desire on my heart to help them. Whether, whether it was here in, in Africa, or whether it was in America, or India, or wherever it might have been, God began to put on my heart a holy ambition. A holy ambition to be able to reach somebody else. A new vision for my life. Now, I didn't retire at 30. I retired from engineering at 32. What I do now is not work. What I do now is I love being able to go and help people. See, it became a new holy ambition in my life for what God wanted me to do. See, there, there can be a different. It, it, you can have the same goal. You can have the same thing. God can put you in a place to, to fulfill the desires of your heart. Psalm 37 4 says, Seek first the kingdom of God. I mean, the Psalm 37 4, that's, that's, that's Matthew 6 33. Psalm 37 4 says, God will give you the desires of your heart. The desires of your heart. See, the desires of your heart will drive. That, that vision which will dr- drive that desire, which will dr- drive that ambition. Ambition, holy ambition in our life. You know, even the disciples, God, when, when, when he sent Jesus, Jesus gr- got a group of guys together who were ambitious. Do you remember at one, at one point they were arguing amongst themselves about who was going to be the greatest when they got to heaven? Who was going to be the greatest when they got to heaven? What I, what I studied through that was Jesus never corrected them on wanting to be the greatest. He even showed them how to get there by serving others, by making yourself little. He says, whoever is the least will be the greatest when they get to heaven. Whoever is the servant of all will be the leader of all. He begins to give them a formula for being the greatest. He begins to encourage a holy ambition inside of them. An ambition for them to be able to do what they should be doing. You know, we should have a vision in our life that's not based out of selfish ambition. What happens with selfish ambition is we begin to achieve things in our life and then we realize it's just not as good as what I thought it might have been. A holy ambition begins to walk us into our purpose of what God created us for and then we realize there's nothing better than where I'm at right now. All of us should have a holy ambition for every area of our life. You should have a holy ambition for your marriage. You should have a holy ambition for your children. You should have a holy ambition for, for all of those things, for your job, for your business, if, you, if you've got one, or maybe you don't have one and, and God's got that on your heart to have a business, for your church, for reaching people. We should have a holy ambition that moves us toward those things. We should have a vision that makes us want to make a difference in the world we live in. 
I believe those are, those are the visionaries I see that seem to make a difference in the world is when it's not just focused on them. It's not just focused on me. It's not just focused on what do I get out of this vision, what do I get out of this ambition, but what does the world get out of this ambition? I believe vision is a kingdom principle that so often get left. The, the, the thing that I'm asked the most by people is, it's kind of in a statement, they say, I don't really know what my purpose is. They don't have an ambition for their own life. They don't know what they're doing. They, they get up every morning, they go to work, they come home, they eat dinner, they go to bed, they get up the next morning to go to work, and they really don't have a purpose, an ambition, and a vision for their own life. I believe God wants us to have a holy ambition that drives us to a vision to reach a purpose that changes our world. Let me give you a definition of holy ambition. Holy ambition is building something great while helping others, honoring God, and staying humble. So what I want to do is I want to take this definition, break it down a little bit, try to get a little deeper into it, and then then we'll hit some points at the end on driving that ambition to get there. So building something great, a great life, a great family, a great business, great kids, a great church, we should have an ambition to have something great. There's nothing wrong with having greatness in our life. I believe that's what God has called us to. You know, the Bible says that we're joint heirs with Christ. We're, we're, we're ambassadors to the king. We're, we're supposed to be in, in royalty with him. We should have a greatness about what our life is. The things you put your hand to, there should be greatness to those things. I want to shake us out of just mediocrity. That's not what the church was created for. Us as Christians, we're better than than just average. We should have a holy ambition that is greater than what we see the people around us who are not Christians. And that's not saying anything bad about them. They should look at us and say, I want what they have so they can get to the same place we are. We should have something about us propels us to another level. I don't want us to waste our time on average and ordinary. There should be nothing average or ordinary about us. We should, take, we should take the, well, that's good enough phrase out of our own life. I believe God has something better for your life. I believe the, the dream you have for your life, God has a better one. I believe the vision you have for your life, God has a better one. We've got we've to raise our standard to be greater than settling. We've got to begin to stir up that holy ambition inside of us. We need to build something greater in our life. God has set eternity on the hearts of men. That's an ambition. It's an incredible ambition. The Amplified says he has set a divine sense of purpose on man you were created for greatness you were created for significance I don't care what somebody else has told you I grew up in a home where I was told a whole lot worse I'm telling you what God is saying God says you were created for greatness doesn't matter what's happened in your life doesn't matter what's happened to you. It doesn't matter what you have done. See, the good thing about the blood of Jesus is it washes all of that. It gets rid of all of that. God doesn't see that on your life anymore. He sees a purpose and a dream and a plan for you that's a lot greater than the limitations we allow ourselves to. You don't have to be perfect to fulfill God's dream for your life. You don't have to be perfect 
to fulfill the desire that God has for your life. You don't have to be perfect to have an ambition. Your life doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to be without struggle. You don't have to be without, without even, even some sins in your life because we are human still. We can have a desire to live perfect before God, but that doesn't mean every time we make a mistake that, that we go to a back room and beat ourselves up and say we're not worthy anymore. The blood of Jesus made you worthy. It's not anything you've done. You know, we didn't do anything to become a Christian except, except, except Jesus. So if we didn't do anything to become a Christian, how can we do anything to fall out of favor with God? It's all about the blood of Jesus. So we've got to begin to, to look at what God says about us and not what Satan says about us. I, 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 I want to stir you up today to see that God has a better plan in your life. God has something greater than, than, than just where you are right now. God has something better for you than to just live a life without greatness, without destiny. God has something great for each one of you. Look at our, look at our definition that we're going off of right here. Holy ambition is becoming something great while helping others. Philippians 2, 4, which we said, it says, each of you should not look only at your own interest, but also to the interest of others. The Bible doesn't say we can't take care of ourselves. We're supposed to take care of ourselves. We're supposed to look at, at how we can take care of us, how we can take care of our family, how we can take care of the, the, the areas in our life that we should, but in the same process, we should be saying, what does that do for somebody else as well? See, a, a selfish life, you'll never be satisfied with. You'll always find someone, no, what, what, whatever your dream might be, listen to me, you'll always find someone who's smarter than you. You'll always find someone who has more money than you. You'll always find someone who has a little better than what you have. So when you have a selfish desire that I want to have the best of whatever that might be, you're going to end up disappointed. But when you have a holy desire that I want to be able to bring myself to a level so that I then can help others, then you can be satisfied that you can achieve that vision, that ambition, that purpose in your life. See, we should, we should, we should want to have something good in our life. If you only say, I've got a desire to help people, but you don't have a job, you don't have any money, a lot of times we get, we get limited by what we don't have. The best thing you can give to a world that, that, that is hurting and dying is a healthy you. If you don't have success in your life, you can't give success. If you don't have a great marriage in your life, it's going to be hard to give a great marriage to somebody else and teach them how to live that way. If you don't have great children in your life, it's going to be hard for you to tell somebody else how to have great children in their life. If you don't have a great job, it's going to be hard for you to tell somebody else how to get a great job. If you don't have money, it's going to be hard for you to help somebody else get past that. There's nothing wrong with the side to take care of self. But if it's only about self, then we begin to run into a wall. While helping others, look at the rest of what we said, building something great while helping others, honoring God, and staying humble. Philippians 2, the passage we read in verse 11, it says, to honor God the Father. The Bible uses an analogy of a field. It talks about those who work in the field. They sow good seeds. They believe for rain. They pull weeds. They manage the soil. You got the ones who, who work that. And if you've ever done any farming at all, you, you, you know that there, there's a hard part that comes on that side. Even the part of believing for rain. We haven't had the rain we had last year. Just looking at my rain totals 
from this year to last year, and we're about half of what we were last year. I got over 1,600 millimeters of rain last year. This year, I'm just over 800. So you look, you look at those things, and there is work that's required to farming, just like there's work that's required to farming our own life, to get in our life to the point where we need to be. But then there's a harvest that comes. The harvest is for you and your family. Then what the Bible teaches is to leave the edges for the ones who are in need. See, it talks about working a field. It talks about getting a harvest. But then it says, leave the edges for those that are in need so they have some too. And then the Bible talks about giving back to God through your tithe, through your offering, whatever those might be. So, so, the, so the Bible begins to explain this in the way of a harvest so we can understand the purpose of our ambition for our life and what we get out of it. How then do we distribute what we have? It's not just for us, it's for others. Philippians 2.3 says, In humility, consider others than yourself. We should always look at others first. Always look at what we can do for those around us before we look at what does that do for me. God's grace is to fuel what we need to accomplish what God's called us to accomplish. God's given you the grace to accomplish those things. If God's put it on your heart, if God's put the desire in your life, he's given you the grace for it. What happens is pride and selfish ambition begins to choke out that grace. And look, I, I, I think this is something because we all live in a human body and a human body wants glorification for itself. All of us live into that and it's something we have to deal with every day. Every morning I try to get up and say it's not about me. It's got to be about somebody else because what happens is, is I know me. And I know me wants to get glory. I know me wants to get what it wants. And if I don't tell me that it's not about me, then me will take over. Every day. You don't get to the point where you don't fight with it. I, I think so often we think that there's a level where you get to where, where, where you're not selfish anymore. All of us have that inside of us. But it's about overcoming that in spite of what we want. There's nothing wrong with wanting those things. You just got to control it. You got to tell it, it's not about you. Holy ambition is building something great. Come on, tell your neighbor, I'm going to build something great. While helping others, honoring God, and staying humble. Philippians 4.13, it, it, it says this. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We've quoted that verse over and over. I know it's so often in the church. The Amplified Version says, I have the strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who influences inner strength into me. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. But then the next verse says this, Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. This is Paul writing to the church in Philippians. Sometimes we can quote these verses and we, we, we don't really know the context of what they were written in. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then he says, Yet it was you who shared with me in my troubles. Verse 15 says, Moreover, as the Philippians know, in the early days, your acquaintance in the gospel 
when I set out to Macedonia, not only one church shared with me in this matter of giving and receiving, except you only. So Paul, after, after he talks about having an ambition, not a selfish ambition, but an ambition, then he begins to tell the church at Philippi, he said, you all were the only ones who began to share with me during those times when I had nothing. Paul, while he was trying to reach the known world with the gospel, I believe it was a holy ambition. I believe it was a purpose he had for his life. It wasn't selfish because he gave up all of that. He said, all of my degrees, all of my titles, all of my wealth is nothing but dirty rags. He said, but I've got a new purpose. So he went all through the world preaching the gospel, planting churches, loving people, and he said the church at Philippi was the only one of those churches that he was able to plant that actually helped him and gave him finances to do that. Paul had a holy ambition and people began to help him. Let's be honest, any ambition of God is going to require money. It's going to require finances. There's no way to accomplish without putting finances into that. Money is a tool. And I, I, I think so often we, we, get, we get tied up in that, and, and it becomes part of a quote. People, I've heard it so often say that money is the root of all evil. But that's not a true quote. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. The Bible actually says money solves all things. If you have a holy ambition... It is going to require you to invest your finances, invest your energy, invest your time, invest your things into it. Holy ambition requires you to still do work, requires you still to give to make it happen. When I was in Bible school, I would speak with different people and they would tell me about the dream they had for their life, the vision they had for their life. These were people who who were going to Bible school, who were committed to it. This has been 20 years ago. And I talked to those people today They still tell me about the same dream, but they're no closer to getting there. They've either never put the time into it, they've never put the finances into it, they've never put the commitment into it. There's always something that's blocking them from getting there. There will always be something blocking you It's called the enemy. It's called the one who is there to resist us. We have to push through. And one of those areas that I find normally is the biggest hindrance is finances. We have to push through. And and somebody's not going to give you something until they see that you're going to do something with what you already have. If you've got a holy ambition in your life, you've got to take the excuses, move them out of the way, and begin to put the finances into what that is. How do I make it happen myself to start out with? How do I make it happen to go with? I want to give you three little points on, on, on finances right here, and, and then we're, we're going to be done on holy ambition. The first one is 
we got to realize money is a tool. Money is a tool. We've got to begin to look at it in a different way. Not just looking at it as something I want, something I desire, something I've got to have. We've got to see money is a tool, and money takes on the nature of whoever is holding it. See, money doesn't have a personality itself. Money in itself is not bad. This money, if I, if I left it alone, laid it right here, it won't go out and do anything bad. It won't go out and do anything good either. If I placed it right there, unless somebody come in and stole it, it would be there when we came back the next time. Money in itself is not a bad thing. Money is a tool for us to accomplish things in our life. Yes, money can be there. If we, you know, we, we, we've got to pay for our, our living expenses. We've got to pay for, for food in our life. There's nothing wrong for using that for that. But it also has to pay for the ambition. We've got to put it into what we want to see. You've got to begin to, to look at money in a different way. Money is not the root of evil. Some people don't like to talk about money, especially in church. Since Pastor Larry's the pastor, I figure I can talk about money. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't have to, you know, you can go to complain to him. I don't know why he was talking about money in church, but I believe money is mentioned in the Bible more than anything else. Do you know why it is? Because Jesus wants us to know that money is for a good purpose. We can use finances. The Bible takes finances. Moving the gospel forward takes finances. You to accomplish your dream, your vision, your passion takes finances. In the hands of a believer, money is a tool that helps other people. Not something that hurts other people. Because we know that our ambition should not only help ourselves, but it should help others. So finances in our hands is actually a good tool. Paul thanked the Philippians when they sent him finances or resources. Because he knew that they were helping him accomplishing his goal. Paul planted churches all through Asia Minor. I've been able to go to Turkey and visit some of those churches. I planted a church in, in Ephesus, just outside of Ephesus, where Paul planted one of his churches many years ago. I've been able to visit those areas. But I think that that the Philippians, Paul is trying to give the mindset that, that Paul planted the churches, Paul went there, Paul suffered, but I believe these Philippians that Paul is trying to tell them, this is as much about you as it is about me. You know, that's a good thing about, about being part of a church, is as a church, a church is able to do great things. You know, the church, is, as Pastor Larry has been talking about, the different Christmas projects, the different things that the church works on, the, the, the soup kitchens, all of those adventures the church is able to do, you may not be able to do them all. But as you give finances into it, you're able to do them all. You're able to be part of it. You're able to give into that. You're able to see... The works come. You're able to see the people reached. You're able to see the people come to church and get saved and, and get baptized and begin to follow God and begin to do the desire God has in their life. See, that's what a holy ambition is. A holy ambition is something greater than just yourself. That's what's great about a church. And just because you've got an ambition to see something and you're like, I can't do it myself, that's great because the church can with your help. 
Everybody coming together. Everybody having an ambition. Everybody pulling your resources and making a difference. You know, the truth of the matter is, as a church or as a ministry, if you look at one and you say, you know, I don't know whether what I give is important or not. Look, this church is doing some great things already if you're not giving without you giving. If you are giving, thanks for giving. But in your mind, if you're on the part where you haven't been helping, wouldn't you want to be part of that? I want to be part of that. I want to be part of helping something that's greater than myself. Be part of helping something that's, that's bigger than, than who I am. That's taking money and saying, I'm making money a tool in my hands to accomplish a goal. We've got to begin to look and say, money is a tool. But you know what? Money also is a test. I believe money is a test in your life. The Bible tells us, does not, do not store up riches on earth where they can be destroyed, but where do we store, store up riches in heaven? We store up riches in heaven. What, what, that's a test. Has anybody ever been to heaven? Mm-mm. We, we, we don't even know what riches look like in heaven. So it's a test. Do we truly trust God with our finances? It's just like in Malachi where it says, test me in this and see if I will not open the windows of heaven over your life and pour out such a blessing. But first, we have to trust God. It's a test. Your finances you have in your hand is a test. It's a test for your commitment to God. It's a test for your loyalty. It's a test for your trust. Do we truly trust God? Are we truly living by faith? I think any of us can answer that by looking at where we spend our money. What do we do with our money? If you really trust trust God, your money will prove that you trust God. And I believe money, my last point, I believe money is a trademark in your life. Does everybody know what a trademark is? A trademark, I, I think it's worldwide. I begin to look and I see it on some of the stuff here. But if you've got a logo of a sports team, you'll have a little TM down next to it somewhere, which means it's trademarked. So anytime that shirt or whatever it might be, the ball is sold, that sports team gets money off of that. I believe the way we live our life with finances and with many other things is our trademark to show that we belong to God. When people from who, who are not Christian or from other religions they begin to see you live differently. They begin to realize you must belong to something better than I do. I have have friends who are in, 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 in many different religions and beliefs because I don't believe that you're able to really reach people unless you're willing to befriend them. And I have some friends now who are part of another religion. I'm not going to talk about other religions or anything like that. I don't believe it's biblical that we need to talk other people down. We're supposed to talk us up. I should have enough good about God and Jesus to talk about that I don't need to talk bad about somebody else. But I've befriended these people and they've begun to see in me what they like in helping others, in giving to others, in making a difference in communities. So these guys asked me about some of the Christmas parties we're, we're putting on. And they asked me how they can help. And they told me Friday that I'm supposed to go by tomorrow and they've uh, put together some some finances that they want to give into us celebrating a holiday that's based off of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that they don't follow. See, that's the difference in holy ambition. Holy ambition begins to break yokes. 
it begins to break those bondages in other people's lives that we don't even realize is happening. I believe that God wants to do something great in your life. I believe as I look in this room, I see greatness. It's not because of anything that any of us have done, but it's because of the one who lives inside of us. And I believe God has given each one of us an ambition, a purpose, and a vision for our life. My goal this morning is to stir that back up. My goal this morning was for you to begin to see biblically there's nothing wrong with ambition. You begin to see biblically that the key for me to make a difference is when it's not about me. But also for you to see you're going to have to release your finances, your time into that purpose. Look, just one quick thing. It does not matter how old you are. It does not matter how young you are. God knows both of those. It does not matter whether you're male or whether you're female. It does not matter what color your skin is. Any limitation that you can come up with, I'm going to tell you it does not matter because the God inside of you is greater than anything anybody else can put on you to try to limit you. The first thing that happens when you start to dream, Satan wants to come in and tell you, but you can't. You need to let those go. Just tell, just tell Satan, no, you're a liar because God says, this is my purpose. This is my dream. This is what I'm going to do. And you've got to step out and you've got to start doing. Don't listen to excuses anymore. Don't listen to problems. Don't listen to all the stuff that Satan tries to tell you or even friends and family might try to tell you. Step out and do it. When I quit, when I, when I stopped a very promising engineering career and left that to do volunteer work let me tell you how crazy my family and friends told me I was but right now with what God is doing in my life and what God is doing in other people's lives I'm not lacking in anything but I'm giving like never before It's because of a holy ambition for a vision that God's purpose to be reached in this world. Do you all receive that this morning? Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you. God, I thank you for stirring up. God, I thank you for stirring up an ambition, God, that stirs up a a passion, that stirs up a vision that, that propels us into our destiny, God. God, I thank you for what you're doing in their lives. God, I thank you for what you've done in my life, Father. God, I know what I would be without you, God, and God, I thank you for what you're doing in my life. God, just begin to show us how you see us. God, begin to show us the greatness you want us to walk in. God, begin to show us the places that that you have for us to go, the people you have for us to reach, the love that you have for us to push out. Through us, God, God, you are love. God, let your love flow through us. Father, I thank you. God, I just pray right now, you break 
all of those limitations off of our life. God, all of those things that we've heard other people say about us that's limiting us. God, the things Satan said about us that limits us. God, the things that, the, 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 all the boundaries that's kept us from stepping into our purpose, stepping into our destiny, stepping into our desires, God. God, I break them off their life right now, Father. I rebuke them in Jesus' name. Father, I pray we're able to come out this morning and never walk in that again. God, we're going to walk in new purpose, new desires, new strengths, new new things that you've called us to. Father, I thank you. I thank you for what you are doing right now in these lives. While you have your heads bowed and your eyes closed, nobody looking around, I want to take just a moment and speak with you about your spiritual life. I believe some of us came this morning. Maybe you've never made Jesus Lord of your life. Maybe that's your first ambition that you need to have is making Jesus Lord of your life. Well, you came to the right place because this morning, he's right here to meet you. There might be another group in here. Maybe there's some of us that came in this morning and, and, and we, we know what it's like to serve God. We know what it's like to, to give God our all, but we've, we, we've stepped away from that. We don't have the relationship with God that we used to have, but we want to get it back. You know, for you, it's, it's just one step. God's right here. Jesus is right here to reconnect with you. And it's very easy. All we have to do is know that we've made mistakes in our life. All we have to know is that Jesus paid the price for all of those mistakes, no matter how many times you've made them. And then we just got to ask God, God, forgive me and make me new. Come into my life. It's that simple. If you're here this morning and you know you either need to accept Jesus for the first time or maybe you need to come back to him with nobody looking around, I want you to raise your hand up now. There's a hand. There's another hand. I see two hands. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's another hand, three hands, four hands. Come on, don't miss out. God's moving this morning. God's moving this morning. He's propell- propelling people into their destiny. Anybody else? Anybody else? Here's what I want us to do. I want us all to pray together. Let's all stand up and pray together. If you're here and you raised your hand, I want you to make this a new declaration to God in your life. The rest of us, we've been right where you are and we are so excited and so proud of you. We're going to say the prayer with you. All of us enter together. Let's say this prayer together. Father God, Thank you for Jesus. God, I've made mistakes in my life. I know Jesus paid the price for them. Father, I'm going to stop what I'm doing. I'm going to turn towards you. And I'm going to make Jesus Lord of my life. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Let's give all those guys a big hand clap.